Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you so much for bringing us to this sacred place, safe and sound. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit may abide in tabernacle with us. Dear Lord, I pray that you would please be with my heart and my mind. I pray, dear Lord, that all of the things that you have put into my understanding may be properly communicated to your people that my defectiveness in no way may hinder the blessing and efficacy of this message. And I just pray that you would please be with our online audience, that you would bless them as well and those that may watch this in the future. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, in light of that, let's open up our Bibles to the book of... Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Joel. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of Joel. And as we see here on our screen, all right. All righty. Now, does everybody see this here on the screen? Yes. Now, when you see this picture, what comes to your mind? When you see this picture, what comes to your mind? Time. Yes, the fact of time. Now, the backdrop of this clock, does this show a world in happiness and, and great elation? No. no, it doesn't. It literally shows a world in turmoil. Now, again, unfortunately, contrary to popular opinion, Satan tries to give this illusion that the, that the earth as we know it is in a great state of being. We see all of the, the celebrities. We see all of the regalia. We see all of these things on social media. And it leaves this impression upon the mind that everything is okay. But does the Bible say that the world is going to get better or, it's, or is it going to get worse before the second coming of Jesus? It's going to get worse. Now, brothers and sisters, this is not as a means of being doom and gloom, but this is the unfortunate reality. Now, in the book of Joel, we're in Joel chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 14. Joel chapter 1, we're going to read in verse 14. It says, Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn what? Assembly. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. As a destruction from the Almighty, it shall what? It shall come. Now, the Bible is here depicting the state of things right before and during this epoch of the second coming of Christ. Now, this language that the, Bible's, that the Bible uses, is this serious language or is it very light language? It's very serious language. Now, in light of that, notice, notice what the prophet of God says in light of this. This says, before the flood swept upon the world, God sent a message through Noah to warn the people of the coming deluge. Now, that word deluge just signifies a flood. Now, why was God bringing a flood upon the ancient deluvian world? Why was God bringing a flood? Was it because they were uh, having too many Chuck E. Cheese parties? Is this why God was bringing a flood? Was this because they were merely cheating on their taxes? Yes. Say it again. Yes, they were very evil. The Bible says that the imagination of their hearts was only evil continually. It says uh, there were those who did not believe the warning, but their unbelief did not what? And again, friends, contrary to popular opinion, even if persons don't believe this reality, this does not mean that it's not going to happen. The antediluvians, there were many of the people of that day who claimed to be uh, scientists. They, came, they claimed to be all of the, the, the great thinking men and women of that age. And they were trying to convince Noah and his associates that it was not going to rain. Did it rain? The very reason why the terrain of this planet looks the way it does is because of the flood. Even though all of the so-called so -called archaeologists and Darwinian evolutionists trying to act like this event didn't take place, the very surface of this planet testifies to the fact that the flood was actually an historical event. It was not merely a children's bedtime story. 
It says, and today, while the last message is being heralded to God's servants into harmony with every precept of his law, there will be scoffers and unbelievers. So we must be faithful to the great trust that God has given us. We must not shrink from presenting the truth of heaven to this generation. Because the truth of heaven to this generation, is it a message of hatred or is it a message of love? It's a message of love. You see, the very fact that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary shows how much heaven is trying to win our souls. And the fact that we are constantly scoffing this message is a great indication of how hard the heart is. All right. This says, I have not come to cry peace. You can hear this voice wherever you go. There are those who will be glad to lull you to sleep in carnal security. And it is an unfortunate indication of the times that so many professed pulpits in Christendom are crying peace and safety. Even amongst us as seven-day Adventists, we are not faithfully preaching the message that God has given to us. It says to bid you to, ref it says my message is to do what? Now when an alarm clock goes off, what tends to happen to us as individuals? Are we very calm? No, the very purpose of an alarm clock is to awaken us. God is saying that he is trying to awaken us out of our spiritual slumber. God is trying to get us to understand that if we are going to make it to heaven at last, our lives must be in conformity to his will. You see, Jesus died on the cross to give us the power to live above sin. The very fact that Jesus was able to live a sinless life is the greatest evidence that we can do the same exact thing. It is a deception of Satan to make us believe that we cannot overcome. It doesn't matter if it's impatience, if it's gluttony, if it's licentiousness. Whatever the sin may be, Jesus has enough power to give us victory over our sins. It says, my message is to alarm you, to bid you to reform your lives and to cease your rebellion against the God of the universe. Take the word of God and see if you are in harmony with it. Is your character such as will bear the search of the heavenly what? Of the heavenly investigation. Now, we are currently living in something called the investigative judgment. Now, again, is the investigative judgment, is it serious or is it not serious? serious. It's very serious. Literally, the great controversy as we know it is hanging upon the results of this investigation. Now, in light of that, everybody see this. Now, what month are we currently in? What do we celebrate during this month? We celebrate something called black history. We celebrate something called black history. Now, does anybody know what is the title of this message? It's called In the Trial of Rome. But before we get to the trial of Rome, we want to understand something intelligently and spiritually. Now, this is a black man reading a book. Now, is reading very in vogue in today's society? No. Do the vast majority of people read books? No. Whether white, black, Asian, or Russian, the vast majority of the world's population does not read anymore. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. Now, do the vast majority of us as Christians like to read? No, no we don't. Now, think about this. <laughs> Can we be proper Bible-believing Christians and not like to read? Because by default, we have to read the Bible. Now, brothers and sisters, this is also something else. If we don't naturally like to do these things, can God give us new tastes? Yes, he can. He can give us new tastes. Now, on our screen is a gentleman. Does anybody know who this man was? This was Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a 19th century African-American abolitionist and author. Now, notice what Frederick said as it pertained to his um, uh, furtherance in his reading prowess. I lived in Master Hughes' family about seven years. During this time, I succeeded, succeeded 
in learning to read and write. Now, did the average slave at this time know how to read and write? No, they didn't. In accomplishing this, I was compelled to resort to various stratagems. Now, the vast majority of the American population knows how to read, and it is shameful how for granted we take this privilege. I had no regular teacher. It says, my mistress who had kindly commenced to instruct me had in compliance with the advice and direction of her husband not only ceased to instruct, but had set her face against my being instructed by anyone else. She at first lacked the depravity indispensable to shutting me up in mental what? You see, when we are not actively seeking to educate ourselves both spiritually and intellectually, we are in mental darkness. It doesn't matter, again, if you're white, black, Asian, or Southeast Pacific, whatever it is. If we are not seeking to become intelligent, especially regarding the things of God, we are in mental darkness. It says, it was at least necessary for her to have some training in the exercise of irresponsible power. All right, now does anybody know who this man was? It's a man by the name of Anthony Stewart. He as well was an African-American abolitionist during the 19th century. Notice what the man said. Does not the Bible inform us that God hath created of one blood of all nations of the earth? Now, does the Bible say that? Yes, yes it does. Now, where does the Bible say that? All right, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 17. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 17, and let's notice what the Word of God says. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 24. Acts chapter 17, we're going to start in verse 24. Uh, when you have it, you can say amen. amen. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood of all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth." And had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of what? Every one of us. So it was God that had providentially ordained the structuring of the nations. And according to the text that we just read, why did God disperse the nations the way he did? Okay, so according to the text, so that we can feel after him and find him. John chapter 17 says that the great purpose of life is to know God. And from the very dawn of civilization, God has been seeking to orchestrate events to ensure that every person living on this planet has an opportunity to know God. Does that make sense? Now notice what uh, our dear our brother goes on to say. Hence, I have come to the conclusion that God created all men what? Equal. Equal. Is there any such thing as racial superiority? No. no, there isn't. And place them upon this earth to do good and benefit what? Not to hate each other, but to benefit. All nations are alike intelligent, enterprising, and what? Every civilization upon this planet has been intelligent, industrious, and has the ability to be enterprising as well. All right. Now, does anybody know who this man was? Yes, a man by the name of Marcus Garvey, very uh, world-renowned Pan-Africanist. Notice what the man said. Let the people know that God is not white, nor is he black. I'll read that again. Let the people know that God is not white, nor is he black. And especially coming from this brother, because he was black, black. The greatest thing that Christ taught was hatred. It was love. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
in these statements are wrapped the highest ideals of a what? The highest ideals of a Godhead. So the great purpose of the Bible is to teach us to love our neighbor. That's his purpose. If we can get this understanding, do you think that there will be war? Would there be extortion on the part of the government? Would there be killing in the streets? Would there be adultery and fornication? There would be none of these things if we understood how to love our neighbor. But the question is, how do we come into the ability to be able to love our neighbor? Does this make sense? Yes. Now again, what is the title of this morning's message? In the trial of Rome, we're getting to a point. We're getting to a point. There has been no greater philosophy in the history of mankind. Plato, Socrates, Aristotle have nothing on the words of Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. All right, now notice Frederick Douglass again. Notice. If you want to hide something from a Negro, put it in a what? Now, unfortunately, this is not just as it pertains to us as black people, especially in this generation. If you want to hide something from a common person, as it were, just put it in a what? And you would think that the world had no access to the Bible, especially considering how ignorant we are of its principles. Now, in light of that, we're going to get into the crux of this understanding of the trial of Rome. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. Because again, according to the words of Frederick Douglass, if you want to hide something from a Negro or any person, you put it in a book. And again, what is the greatest book that has been given to humankind? It is the Bible. It is the Bible. All right, let's turn it up. I was to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. Ecclesiastes after Proverbs. We're actually after, the, um, after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 9. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 9. It says, The thing that hath been is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the what? Under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is... You know, it's amazing. Satan tries to make us believe that in this modern civilization that we call it in the West, that we have somehow reached the apex of human intelligence and ingenuity. But we are actually told in the spirit of prophecy, if we could see the technological advancements of the antediluvians, they would make us seem like children in intelligence. It says, see, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us, which was before us. Now, does everybody see this picture? Now, we have here this Roman emperor that's looking over his vast empire, and what is he looking at in the distance? The American flag. I wonder if there is any correlation between the empire of Rome and the empire of the United States. Because we're going to find out that the United States is not a democracy. The United States is no longer a constitutional republic. We are a vast empire, just like the Roman just like the Roman Empire. Does that make sense? Yeah. Notice this. Now, does anybody know who this man was? It's a gentleman by the name of P.T. McGann, one of the uh, great uh, Seventh-day Adventist educators of the 20th century. Notice what the man says on this point. Among the great nations of ancient times, the Republic of Rome is at once the most gigantic and striking figure. In the history of mankind, only two republics have ever risen to a pitch of grandeur and prominence sufficient to entitle them to a rank in the galaxy of great world powers. Of these, the Republic of the Romans is one, and the United States of America is the what? It is the other. Now, does the Bible talk about the empire of Rome? Yes, it does. Now, where does the Bible talk about the empire of Rome? 
Daniel, yes. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel. You know, many times I hear such phrases as, you know, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we know the prophecies. We know that the, that the seventh day is the Sabbath. We know the 2300 days and all these things. Now, that might have been true 90 years ago. But sadly, we live in a day and age when the vast majority of us as Seventh-day Adventists have absolutely no idea what we believe. This is one of the great reasons why our young people are leaving the church in droves is because we are not dil diligently educating not only our children, but ourselves. All right, Daniel. Daniel. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. Let's read in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, we're going to read in verse 7 and 8. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7 and 8. It says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. It says, And it had great iron teeth, it devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had how many horns? Ten horns. I considered the horns, and beheld there came up among them another what? Another little horn. Before whom were there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and beheld in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great, and a mouth speaking great things. The Bible here is giving us a delineation of the history of the Roman Empire and eventually when it more metamorphosized into the papacy. Now, does that make sense? All right. This says Republican forms of government have proved even less enduring. This constitutes no criticism. Popular government is an experiment upon the heart of man. I wish we had time to get into the details of what this means. When once the heart is unchained and personal or national ambition is allowed to have full sway, then freedom's rule is at an end. Notice, arbitrary power is most easily establish, established on the ruins of liberty abused to licentiousness. From being a republic, Rome was converted into a military empire. Have we become a military empire here as the United States? Now, the Bible, to, actually, let's turn to it. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 13. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 13. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 13, because again, we want to understand these things intelligently. Just as Rome became a military empire, we as the United States have become the exact same thing, but we want to know why. Why has the United States become a military empire? We're getting to a point. Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to start in, we're going to start in verse 13. It says, and he doeth great wonders, speaking of this two-horned beast, the United States, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had a wound by a sword and did what? Now this first beast of Revelation 13 is the papacy. The great reason why the United States has become a military empire is that we are going to eventually overtly give our power over to the papacy. This is what the Bible is saying. Now notice this. Again, from being a republic, Rome was converted into a military empire. Today, the Republic of the United States is coursing over the same track. Now, we want to understand, again, in some detail, how we are following in these steps. Because one of the greatest things that God really needs for us to understand this morning is that these things are literally about to happen. Dear friends, especially here living in the United States, to a very great degree, we have been spoiled by all of the privileges that God has graciously given to us. And as a result of that, we have not been properly preparing neither spiritually nor practically for what is about to come. And again, even though the people of Noah's day were scoffing against the message, 
Did that stop the flood from coming? You see, it doesn't, in order to scoff against God's message, it doesn't mean that we have to openly say that we don't believe in the Bible. The only thing that has to happen is for our life to not be in congruence with the word of God. All right. Now, this, uh, this uh, particular gentleman on our, uh, our screen is a gentleman by the name of Froude. Uh, he was an English historian during the 19th century. Notice what this man says about the decline of the Roman Empire. Notice this. With such vividness, with such transparent clearness, the age stands before us of Cato, Pompey, Cicero, and Julius Caesar. The more distinctly because it was an age in so many ways the counterpart of our own. It was an age of material progress and material civilization. The free cultivators were disappearing from the soil. Italy was being absorbed into vast estates and held by a few favored families. The rich were extravagant for life had ceased to have any practical interest except for its material pleasures. Is that the current state of society? Yes, it is. Again, we're getting to a point. Patriotism survived on the lips. It says, but patriotism meant the ascendancy of the party, which would maintain the existing order of things or would overthrow for a more equal distribution of the good things which alone were valued. Religion, once the foundation of the laws and rules of personal conduct, had subsided into opinion. But of the genuine belief that life had any serious meaning, there was none remaining beyond the circle of the silent. You know, it's amazing. I was literally watching a news telecast and it was talking about a Republican uh, politician in Florida. It was a woman and her husband. And this particular politician, her and her husband would go on and on about the need of us as Americans being patriotic, of us needing to cultivate family values of the importance of properly educating our children, but it literally came out in the news that her and her husband were overtly engaging in threesomes. And brothers and sisters, this hypocrisy that is being given to the forefront, it is being unmasked. All right, this is a gentleman by the name of Chris Hedges. He is a uh, American uh, journalist and author. Notice what this man says about the current condition of the United States. The U.S. government subservient to corporate power has become a what? A burlesque. The bloated military sucking the marrow out of the nation is unsaliable. Does anybody know how much we as the United States spend on defense every year? Anybody know? We spend about $1 trillion on defense every year. This is literally where our tax dollars are going to. For us, literally, so that Lockheed Martin and Boeing can make more bombs to kill people in the Middle East. It says, poverty is a nightmare for half the population. Poor people of color are gunned down with impunity in the streets. Our prison system, the world's largest. We have the largest amount of people per capita in prison more than any other nation. Again, is it possible for a nation to continue like this in this condition? Brothers and sisters, this country is about to collapse. And the Bible tells us, according to Bible prophecy, what we read in Daniel chapter 2 and all throughout the sacred writings, that the only government that is going to succeed this, this world empire is the empire of Jesus Christ. And by show of hands, who wants to be a part of the empire of Jesus Christ? You see, because contrary to these world empires, there's going to be no avarice. There's not going to be any hatred, no extortion. There's only going to be love, peace, and joy. You know, the Bible even says that God has gone to prepare us mansions. So much to the point that when we get to heaven, we're going to have our own land that we're going to cultivate. We're going to have gardens, we're going to have orchards, and we're literally going to be growing these precious fruits and produce. It says, but in our disnified world of intoxicating and endless images, the code of self and willful illiteracy. You see, again, we've gotten to a place where we're not only illiterate, but we're willfully illiterate. And again, 
What is the greatest book that God has given to us? Of all of the books that we should be the most familiar with, the Bible is the book for which we are the most ignorant. All right, anybody know what this is? This is a symbol of the Colosseum or the Gladiator Games. I wonder if we are currently doing this in this said United States. I wonder. This is a man by the name of Etienne de la Boétie. He was a French magistrate and politician during the 16th century. Notice what this man says about the ancient Colosseum Games. Plays, farces, spectacles, gladiators, and strange beasts, medals, pictures, and other such what? Again, religion is not the opiate of the masses. It's these foolish entertainments. These were for ancient peoples the bait towards slavery, the price of their liberty, and the instruments of what? We've said this before. Anytime these type of entertainments become predominant in a civilization, you can know very well that that, that, that nation is about to go into slavery. Anybody know what this is? Unfortunately, it may be very well possible that some of us were actively watching these forms of idolatry. And you know, it's amazing. We have been so brainwashed and conditioned that we actually think that the outcomes of these games are not already prefixed. Do you really think that all of the billions of dollars that are being generated by these mechanisms, do you think that this is literally just left up to chance? This is deception. And you're made to believe that, that Patrick Mahomes is, the, is now the greatest quarterback. That Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback as if these men got to these positions merely because of their talent. Again, this is deception. Breaks of the game, how the government subsidizes American sports. Do you know that your tax dollars are actually going to pay for these stadiums? Notice. As people are literally homeless on the street, the government is giving hundreds of millions of dollars in order to keep us sedated. Of course, that, that, still, uh, that can still work out to tens of millions of dollars. And in many cases, that goes into the hundreds of millions. Notice, like the $850 million in-state and local funding that will be going to build a new stadium for the Buffalo Bills. What could you do with $850 million? How many souls could be reached with the gospel with $850 million? What is this? This is a symbol of a movie called Black Panther. You know, especially many of us as colored persons, especially black people, we were told that this movie was actually going to help give us a sense of black identity. But notice this. Why does a white CIA agent play the hero to kill a monger's villain in the Black Panther? You know, in this movie, Black Panther actually was not the hero. It was the white CIA agent. I wonder why. Notice this. Again, we're getting to a point. We're talking about in the trial of Rome. There's a plot point, however, that is leaving some moviegoers a bit puzzled. In the film, Agent Everett Ross is a white CIA uh, operative whose selfless heroics help the Wakandans save their kingdom. However, given the intelligence agency's checkered history, especially in Africa, the CIA's star billing and heroic turn is a celebration of black empowerment. It says, the agency, uh, as uh, Tr uh, Tricia Jenkins explains in her book, has a long history of par partnering with Tinseltown. When that says Tinseltown, that's talking about Hollywood. Dating back to the 1950s, it says, during the Cold War, movies helped win over foreign audiences and helped to shape U.S. foreign policy. Has anybody ever heard of a movie called Rocky IV? In Rocky IV, Rocky Balboa was fighting against the, the steroid-induced Russian man. And people did not even realize that this was brainwashing them to accept United States foreign policy. All right, we're getting to a point. We're getting to a point. 
This says, not surprisingly, the fact that a black revolutionary leader in the Black Panther is the bad guy while the CIA agent is the good guy. Because, you know, the villain in this movie was actually trying to get the resources from Wakanda in order to help black people around the world. But he was demonized while the CIA agent was seen as the savior. Now, again, is the CIA a benefactor for humanity? No, it's not. Killamonger wants to use Wakanda's weapons to stop the suffering of black people globally, and we, the audience, are manipulated into rooting against this. We live in an ideology in which nonviolence is always accepted of black people no matter what. And so it goes on to talk about these things. So do we get the point? I believe we get the point. Now, does anybody know what this is? One of the great reasons why the empire of Rome officially collapsed was because there was a unification of church and state. Has anybody ever heard of a gentleman by the name of Constantine? So besides all of the political corruption, besides all of the bread and circus, the last death knell for the Roman Empire was this fusion of church and state. Is a fusion of church and state currently taking place here in the United States? Yes, it is. Anybody know who this man was? This is a gentleman by the name of A.T. Jones, a very brilliant Seventh-day Adventist Bible expositor. Notice what the man said uh, pertaining to the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. This word, Antipas, is not a person's name. Now, when he says Antipas, does anybody know what he's referring to? Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation. I believe we were already in Revelation. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 2. And let's notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And we're going to start in verse... uh, We're going to start in verse uh, 8. We're going to start in verse 8. Notice what the Bible says. It says, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, for those who do not know, the seven churches in the beginning part of the book of Revelation is is simply just explaining the history of God's church from the first centuries all the way to the end of time. Does that make sense? And as we are reading this experience of Smyrna, this is depicting the experience of God's people during the early centuries of Christianity. Does that make sense? All right. In verse 10, it says, For none of those things which thou shalt suffer, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Now, this is a trivia question. In Bible prophecy, a day equals a what? A day equals a year. Now, when you study this from a historical context, the Bible was actually talking about the 10 years persecution under the Roman emperor Diocletian. Has anybody ever heard of Diocletian? All right. It says, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Now, does anyone know when the persecution of Diocletian was? It was during the early part of the fourth century or the early 300s. So in light of that, this experience of Pergamum is right after this experience. It says, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which had the sharp sword, With two edges, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast thy my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, by show of hands, who believes that Antipas was a real person or if this was merely giving a figure of a particular um, experience? The first or the latter? Who here believes that Antipas was a real person by show of hands? 
Who here believes that it was merely giving a figure or a symbol of something? Who is unsure? By show of hands. Now, there's nothing wrong with being unsure. Let's find out what the Bible says. Verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block. Does anybody remember who Balaam was? So Balaam at one time was a true prophet of God, but he was willing to sell out God's people for the sake of money. So he was a false prophet masquerading as a prophet of God while also selling out God's people for the sake of money. Does that make sense? Can anybody think of a religious political system that acts as Christian but sells out God's people for the sake of money? Can you name an institution like that? The Roman Catholic institution. So does that make sense? So notice what A.T. Jones says. This word Antipas is not a person's name, but is a term characteristic of the times. It is composed of two words, anti and papas. Anti signifies against and papas signifies papa, which is our English and also the universal word for what? And this word Papa is but the repetition of the simple word Pa and is the original word for what? For Pope. Therefore, the word Antipas against Pas or Papas shows the growth of the papacy in the period immediately following A.D. 13. This was the period of who? Of Constantine. And what did Constantine do in 331 A.D.? There was the, or 321 AD, there was an enactment of a what? Of a Sunday law. Now, does everybody get how this is going? Everybody get how this is going? All right, we're coming to a point. This says the immediate effect of this apostasy, which developed the papacy in the Roman Empire, was the complete ruin of the Roman Empire. And this consequence of the apostasy, which is traced in the first three steps, of the two lines of prophecy of the seven churches and the seven seals is sketched in the first four trumpets. Now we're going to jump to the bottom. It says, uh, the seven trumpets aptly here because the trumpet is a symbol of war at the bottom, that there was swept away the mass of corruption that was heaped upon the Roman Empire by its union with the apostate church in making the papacy. Now, do you think that there's any modern application to that reality? Notice, this is a man by the name of James E. Quigley. This man was a Catholic archbishop around the turn of the 20th century. Notice what the man said. Within 20 years, this country, speaking of the United States, is going to rule the world. Kings and emperors will soon pass away and the democracy of the United States will take their place. When the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will do what? And again, we're brainwashing to believe that when we go to the to the uh, voting ballot and we cast our vote, that we're actually choosing the president. Nothing can stand against the church. I'd like to see the politician who would try to stand, who would try to rule against the church in Chicago. His reign would be short indeed. Has anybody ever read a book called 50 Years in the Church of Rome? Do you know the ex-Catholic priest Charles Chinoquie? literally delineates how the Jesuits of Rome literally concocted the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Now, in light of that reality, I wonder who is behind the, the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. All right. Now, does that, everybody see what this is? When you see this picture, what comes to the imagination? Now, the greatest thing that happened during the epoch of the Roman Empire was the birth of Jesus. Now, was the birth of Jesus a very important event? Yes, it was. Let's turn in our Bibles. We're coming to a close. Let's turn in our Bibles. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Now, remember, we're talking about the trial of Rome. Matthew, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 1. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 1. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 18. 
It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the what? Of the Holy Ghost. Had the Bible prophesied already that a virgin would conceive? Yes. Now, what book of the Bible said that a virgin would, con would conceive? Isaiah, yes. Then Joseph, uh, her husband, being a just man and not, willing, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away what? Privily, privily yes. Now, why was Joseph contemplating putting her away privily? She was pregnant and she was also a... Now... Naturally speaking, is it possible for a woman to be pregnant without the interposition and the working of a man? It is impossible. So Joseph, he was trying to discreetly put her away because in his mind, she was pregnant with another man's child. But was she pregnant with another man's child? Maybe yes or no. It just wasn't a man of this earth. <laughs> yes, the Holy Ghost. All right, in verse 19, it says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to put her, make her public example, verse 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a what? In a dream. Saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the what? Just think about the practical reality of this. You're engaged to be uh, uh, married and, uh, to a, a wonderful young woman, and then she turns up pregnant, and then you have a dream by an angel that this woman is pregnant with uh, a child that was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Imagine going to your aunts and your uncles saying that, that this child was literally conceived by the Holy Ghost. Now, do you think that you would have to have genuine faith in the word of God to go through with this reality? Yes. This is why it is so very important for us to have an accurate understanding of the word of God. Verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people in their sins. From their sins. So Jesus being born in this lowly manger in Bethlehem was, the perp was for the purpose of saving humanity from our what? From our sins. And this was the greatest thing that took place during the time period of the Roman Empire. Now, what great event is about to take place during this epoch of the United States Empire? Do you see the parallel? Notice. Notice this. This is taken from the Desire of Ages, one of the greatest books ever written upon the life and ministry of Christ. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. Providence had directed the movements of nations and the tide of human impulse uh, and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the deliverer. Notice this. The nations were united under one government. Are we currently living under the auspices of a new world order? Yes. One language was widely spoken. Now, what is the predominant language used in many nations? English, yes. And was everywhere recognized as the language of literature. From all lands, the Jews of the dispersion gathered to Jerusalem for the annual feast. As these returned to the places of their sojourn, they could spread throughout the world the tidings of the Messiah's coming. Now, in light of that, does anybody know what this is? This is actually a sheep. This is actually a symbol of the second coming of Jesus. When you see this picture, does this fill you with happiness and joy and consolation? Why not? Why doesn't this fill you with happiness and adulation? Why doesn't it fill you with, this, with these warm, fuzzy feelings? Does this sheep look very happy? Let's turn it our Bible to the book of Revelation. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 6. Let's notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 6. Let's notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 6. Let's notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 14 as we bring this message to a close. It says, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and every island were moved out of their places. 
Now, what event does that sound like? The second coming. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the what? And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the what? You know, even this is not even a proper description of what the Bible is saying, because is a lamb a full grown sheep or a baby sheep? It's a baby sheep. So the question has to be asked, why in the world are these great men of the earth running from a baby sheep? Isn't that a good question? Why is this baby innocent lamb, why is this baby sheep so angry with these chief men of the world? Is this a good question? It is. Notice what Desire of Ages says. Divine love has been stirred to its unfathomable depths for the sake of men. Why did God the Father send God the Son to this earth to die for the planet? Was it, was it because he was filled with pride and self-exaltation? Was it, was, was it because he was trying to get the arbitrary homage of the universe that he had created? Is this why God the Father sent God the Son to this earth to die for our sins? What does John 3.16 say about this reality? For God so loved the world. Now, in light of God making this great sacrifice, wouldn't it be natural to think that all of the world would just naturally respond to such a precious gift? You would think. And angels marvel to behold in the recipients of so great a love a mere what? You see, brothers and sisters, we truly do not appreciate the vast love of God. By a show of hands, who really believes that Jesus loves them? You see, because many times we say this as a theoretical fact, but we truly do not internalize this reality. And Satan tries to bring in so much trauma into our life that makes it hard for us to believe that God really loves us. Brothers and sisters, don't allow whatever you have gone through to put a barrier between you and your maker. This says, angels marvel at man's shallow appreciation of the love of God. Heaven stands what? Indignant. And again, in light of God being so loving, why is he indignant? The Bible makes it very clear that God is slow to anger. So if God is slow to anger, why in the world is he angry? At the neglect shown to the souls of men, would we know how Christ regards it? How would a father and mother feel did they know that their child lost in the cold and snow had been passed by and left to perish by those who might have saved it? We might have saved the person who was erring, but instead of saving them, we took on our cell phone and took a selfie. We posted it on Instagram and Facebook and literally deceived ourselves into believing that we were doing something for God. Would they not denounce those murderers with wrath hot as their tears and intense as their love? The sufferings of every man are the sufferings of what? Every time a person is raped, God literally feels it. Every time a father abandons their children, God literally feels it. Every, every time a bomb goes off and literally blows someone's head off, God literally feels it. You know, Desire of Ages says that when our body is raging with fever, that God feels what our body is going through. This says, and those who reach out no helping hand to their perishing fellow beings provoke his what? Not his unrighteous anger, but his righteous anger. This is the what? You see, this is the wrath of the Lamb. You see, our condemnation does not come merely because we were living in the world at one time. It doesn't come merely because we were doing the wrong thing at one time. It's because we knew the truth, but made a conscious decision to turn away from it. To those who claim fellowship with Christ and have been indifferent to the needs of their fellow men, he will declare in the great judgment day, I know you not whence ye are, depart from me, all ye workers of what? 
the saddest words that ever fell on mortal ears is, I know you not. Now, God is, is omniscient. God is omnipresent. He is all-knowing all of these things. So how can even God get to the place where he will look at you and say that I have no idea who you are? Anybody know what this is? You see, before the second coming of Jesus, there's another coming that has taken place and that we are currently in progression of. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Malachi. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Malachi. You see, because there's a coming that takes place before the second coming of Jesus. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Malachi in chapter 3 as we bring this to a close. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. Malachi chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way what? And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Now, who is the messenger of the covenant? Jesus, yes. This is God's covenant of peace that he will restore us back into his image. Whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, say the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller soul. Now, when Jesus comes back the second time, is he going to be refining anybody? Is he, is he going to be developing Christian character in anyone when he comes back the second time? So again, what coming is this referring to? Let's continue to read. It says, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in what? Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former what? You see, this is not talking about the second coming, but this is talking about the coming of the investigative judgment. You see, this is what the Bible talks about in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14. The Son of Man coming to the Ancient of Days. You see, this coming must take place before the second coming. Now, has the investigative judgment started? Now, when did the investigative judgment start? October 22nd, 1844. Now, in light of that, now, does anybody know who this was? Gentleman by the name of Essen Haskell, one of the great intellects that God gave to the Seventh day Adventist movement. As foretold in the scriptures, the ministration of Christ in the most holy place began at the termination of the prophetic days in 1844. The words of the Re revelator applied to this time. The temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the Ark of His Testament. Does anybody know where Haskell is quoting from in the Bible? This is Revelation chapter 11, verse 18 and 19. You can write that down. At the beginning of the work of the investigative judgment, when Christ entered the most holy place, the door in heaven was what? Now, this is a question because we're running out of time. What is the purpose of the investigative judgment? What is the purpose of the investigative judgment? What is the purpose of the investigative judgment? Okay, so to vindicate those who have truly accepted Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that when we surrender to Christ, our names are written in heaven. They're written in God's book of life. But is it possible for your name to be blotted out of the book of life? Do you know that Judas' name was in the book of life? Now, is Judas going to be in heaven? As Judas's name has come up in the investigative judgment, it has been seen very clearly that he was not a true Christian. You see, this is why the Bible, this is why Jesus says over and over and over again in the first three chapters of Revelation, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, to him that endureth unto the end. It says, and the law of God was seen as the foundation of his throne. It was immediately after the bitter disappointment of 1844 when earnest souls were still searching the scriptures that the sacredness of the law was what? 
that the sacredness of the law was revealed. Again, we're getting to a point as we close. It started with the dead. Let's get past this. This is Jay and Andrews. The events under the sounding of the seventh angel, though not given in chronological order, are from their nature not difficult to be arranged in their order and concurrence. The judgment of the righteous dead takes place. It took place uh, uh, October 22nd, 1844. That's when it started. This talks about the judgment of the living. This is from the great controversy and true revival. When that work shall be completed, the judgment is to be pronounced upon the living. Soon, none know how soon it will pass to the cases of the living. Brothers and sisters, who here has ever heard of something called the Day of Atonement? Who here has ever heard of the Day of Atonement? You see, brothers and sisters, as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand, at least we should, that we are currently living in the great day of God's atonement. We're told in great controversy that if we were to properly meditate on this thought, that there, were, there would be many words that would come to our minds that we would never say. There, were things that, there, there would be things that we wouldn't dare to watch on television if we just could understand this reality. Does everybody remember the experience of Joseph? Joseph was a great man in Egypt, as the Bible says. He was very handsome, he was intelligent, and he was very industrious and prosperous. But unfortunately, the Bible says that Potiphar's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. Now, did Joseph engage in fornication and adultery with Potiphar's wife? No. Joseph looked up to heaven. He looked at, uh, looked at that woman and even said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see, jo Joseph uh, literally lived as if he was in the immediate presence of God. Now, did God's presence scare and terrify Joseph? Did he enjoy the fact that he was conscious of the reality that God was with him? Yes, he was. The only time that God's presence becomes a means of condemnation is when we're living in sin. And the reason why we tend not to like to be in God's presence is because we don't like to be around righteousness. And this is all of us. Brothers and sisters, we need to pray that God will actually give us a desire to like the things that God would like. We need to pray that God will give us a desire to study the word of God. We need to pray that God will cultivate in our hearts a love for spiritual things. And if we do this in our homes, do you think it's going to affect our children? Do you think it's going to affect our spouses? Brothers and sisters, as we have seen very clearly, the Roman Empire was the great empire that time that Jesus Christ came in. And this great empire of the United States is the same empire as it were that Jesus Christ is going to come back the second time in. Now, this is the appeal. Was everyone ready for the first coming of Jesus? Unfortunately, very many of the Jews and the people of the world were so caught up in Roman ideology that they were unprepared for Christ's first coming. Is everyone prepared in this generation for Christ's second coming? I wonder if us being so indoctrinated in the United States mindset that we have become unprepared for the second coming of Jesus. And again, the appeal is just very simple. Just by show of hands, who here wants to say that they want to be prepared for Christ's second coming? And not just prepared for Christ's second coming, but to be prepared also for this investigative judgment. Because this great event is going to determine our eternal destiny. And if this judgment is passed, heaven is already guaranteed. And so, brothers and sisters, the only thing that God is calling us to do is to make a decision. In the light of that, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the principles of your word. I just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that if anything or if everything was lost upon our minds, I pray that we would have come away with the fact that you love us with an everlasting love, that you have done everything that you possibly can to save us. But the time to get to know Jesus is closing. We do not have as much time as Satan tries to make us believe, dear Lord. Help us to stop making excuses for our shortcomings of character from the minister on down. Lord, I pray that you would help us to come into proper relation with you and not just for ourselves, 
but that we may be in a position to help our neighbors, that we may be in a position to help our coworkers. Unfortunately, many of us have been coming in contact with people year after year after year, and they probably have no idea that we profess the third angel's message. Lord, help us to arouse out of this spiritual lethargy. Lord, help us to have a fervent burden for those who are perishing in ignorance of God's loving and holy law. And I just pray that you would please be with us upon the Sabbath, that we may meditate upon these things, that we may be transformed, not only intellectually, but that we may be transformed spiritually. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.